we were lucky to have Craig Brown with us today, and uh, we're going to do the collaboration deep dive deep dive session with him. So, without further ado, over to you, Craig. Hi, everyone. Today, we're going to do a little exercise. Uh, we're going to do a collaborative exercise, and I'm just going to share a link in chat. So uh, what we're going to do today is run through a series of questions. At the end, I'm going to share some insights and data that I have accumulated over doing this workshop for three, the last three years. So I've been doing this I've been doing this session in agile conferences and meetups, um, mainly in Australia, but around the world, including the United States and Europe and Asia. Um, I started this process because we wanted to better understand what good collaboration is. We, we hear the word collaboration and we think, yes, must be good, but we don't really think beyond that. And I think that brute force thinking around the idea is all collaboration is good. Um, but then that leads to problems. For instance, if you're not collaborating my way, your collaboration is bad and my collaboration is good. So how do we unpack those big ideas and turn them into something that's more negotiable, more actionable and tangible and helps us make real progress at the front line of work? So what we're going to do today is it's a two-part two part activity. The first part is I'm going to guide you through a bunch of questions. Now, I've just realised none of you can talk to me. Is that right? I can hear no one talking to me. So this, uh, this session is very much built around <laughs> the idea of me asking you questions and people from the audience sharing back. Now it appears this platform isn't going to let us do that. So we're going to have to find a workaround. Uh, I think we'll have to use the chat a little bit and then I'll do some narration and just sharing some stories from previous sessions. So another thing that I'd like you to do is you see this link is good, better collab, right? So we've, I've put this in the, uh, in the chat um, on this site and, um, and if you could, there it is. If you could click on that, what we're going to do at the beginning is we're going to go through a series of uh, questions together. And if you type them in, what I've been doing with this website, it's a Google form. At the end of it, I'm just accreting all the data, right? And so if you put your email address in at the end, I'll share with you the data as I get to stages of doing analysis and insights. Um, if I don't, uh, if I don't get your name, I don't share anything back, but I will, you know, I'll talk about that more at the end. Meanwhile, what I want to do is lead you through these questions and, and with, with no one speaking back, it's going to be interesting. There's going to be these moments of silence, right? But just bear with me. So in, in 35 odd minutes or 30 minutes from now, we're going to run through these questions and then at the back, the next step, I'm going to pull up some PowerPoint pages and show you some charts and diagrams and reflect on the things that I've learned doing these activities. So the first thing I would like you to ask yourself is what's a situation where you've seen great collaboration at work? And in particular, as you're thinking about it, what were the attributes, what were the things that made it great? Right? What were the behaviours in the particular situation that you're thinking of that made that situation great? So if you guys type an answer in here, what will happen is over time I'll add that to my data set and as we work through this thing and then I'll play back some information to you after this event. What I will play to you at the end of this event is the aggregated data from previous previous workshops. So just you're taking a moment right now to think, where did I see great collaboration?
And those of you that are sitting there waiting, grab a pen. If you don't want to do it online, grab a pen and paper and do it that way. Writing things down and reflecting is going to help us get to where we want to be. Okay. So the second question I want to ask you is, like, why is it we think collaboration is valuable? And, again, in your own time with your own pen and paper, I'm going to ask you to write down a couple of dot points. I'm going to, given you guys can't talk back to me, I'm going to share some examples of things that people have said to me and some examples from my own life. But while I'm doing this, I want you to continue to think about writing your own answer. So two examples of why I think collaboration is valuable for me personally is I don't want to come to work and be a cog in a machine, right? Work is a major part of my life, and I feel like it's a very communal experience. I live in a community. I interact with people and Work for me feels more engaging and rewarding and it energises me more if I'm doing it with other people. So that's one reason why I think collaboration is better for me. Another reason I think collaboration is good is because many brains thinking about a problem, for instance, right, bring more perspectives to bear and are more encompassing in the things that we think about. And so we can see problems from more perspectives and we can generate more options when we start to think about solutions. And we can also bring more experience to bear. So we, we leverage the experience of more people and, and the collective history of 10 of us might be 100 years of work experience, whereas the collective experience of two of us might be only 20, right? Or for some of you, it might be four years, who knows? So there, there's two things. Now, Continue, write one, two, or three dot points more if you want to flood them in. Um, if any of you would like to share any particular examples, throw them into the chat and we can talk about them as well. So I'm very happy for people to, uh, as we look at these screens, very happy for people to throw comments into chat and then I'll play them back to the crowd. The next question I would like to ask you guys is... I just gave you two examples of collaboration, but they, they very much were anchored in what I think of immediately, right? And the context there was me thinking about the, um, the experience that I have at work. The second one, the sec this second set of questions here asks us to think in a step-by-step -step broader organisation. Um, thanks, Ankit. You've also thrown in great collaboration always comes while resolving a production issue. It's funny, isn't it? When we're in crisis, we're much more able to collaborate than when we're in a planned, methodical, controlled process. Uh, good point and hilarious observation. With these questions, what I would like you to do is I'd like you to answer each specific one. So it's what are the benefits of collaboration for me? So you heard me a minute ago say, I get energised by working with everyone else. Not everyone has that experience. Different people have different experiences. So if you could just take a moment to think of why you value collaboration. Then you can go on and you can say, what about my team, the collective around me, the five or ten or whatever people it is that I work with day to day? What are they looking for? And in the context of something like resolving a production issue, what does the team get for better collaboration? What's the value proposition for them? As we continue to think at ever widening perspectives, what's the value of collaboration for our organisation? Why is collaboration good for the whole company, good for the whole organisation or department or wherever you work? So again, great observation, Ankit. Like you know, the team gets its benefits. The, that that benefit um, of the experience of iterating on collaborative activities builds trust and, and there are feedback loops in competence and in trust and enthusiasm and engagement that kind of play and play and play. And they definitely, we see them happen in teams, especially like in those, you know, second stage early adoption of Agile, right, where everyone starts to work together and trust and, and play as a team more. 
And then that cascades out into the organization as well. But how does it cascade into the organization? What are the benefits, say, the executive team or the shareholders see in your organization of better collaboration? Then we can go wider, right? Who is our organization there to serve? Our customers and clients, right? And so what is the benefit that our customers and clients get from improved collaboration? Why is better collaboration going to make their world better? So Rishit suggested value delivery at the earliest opportunity is great for organizations. So if we're working together, we can get things out the door faster. Great, great observation. What are the benefits of collaboration for our customers? Again, write these things down because it's going to be good for you to go through the activity of thinking and writing it down. It makes you think more deeply and critically about these issues. The next question I have for you is beyond the organization and customer relationship. It's the, it's the society and the community that we live in, right? So what is our collaboration at work going to do for our wider community and how is it going to make things better? There. Anand and Ankit have thrown in reduced rework and community get dependability. Um, it's true, right? Like if people do what they're, they, they say they're going to do and it gets done properly, right, there's more feedback loops, the playing to trust and a sense of we're all in it together and a sense of mutual destiny and things like that. So in that page, I've asked you to think about the benefits of collaboration for yourself, for your team, for your organisation, for your customers and for the community that you live in. The next page asks us to say, let's get concrete about it. What does good collaboration look like for you today? And what I would like you to do, sorry, well, I must, must mess this up. What I would like you to do as you think about these questions, there they are, is make it tangible. Now you can write one specific example or you can maybe do two or three. But I'll, I'll use daily stand-ups as an example, right? So for me, uh, collaboration today is our team, my team come together for 10 to 15 minutes, four days a week, and we check in with each other and we ask each other, how are we going and what are we working on, right? We don't really follow the standard, what did I do yesterday, what am I going to do today and what's blocking me? We just say, what are we working on and what's 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 challenging us. So I, I can write that down as an example. But then I could also say, what's better, right? And I would say in the meeting that I do, what would be better would be listening more deeply to each other, right? So we tend to listen superficially. And if somebody says, you know, there's a problem that I'm working on and I don't see my way to the end of it yet, we typically won't dive into that and engage in that conversation further. We'll wait for that person to come and grab us later. But that's actually an early signal that somebody could do with some help. So better for me would be better listening to the signals that people need help. And what's better than that, right? Well, I can't think of a specific, but as I'm talking, I'm thinking maybe what's better than that is that person before the stand-up has already realised that they've got a challenge and they've gone and asked for help before the stand-up. And so when we get to the stand-up, they say, I've been having this problem with this issue, but I've asked that person for help and it's now under control. So there's an example of like, what does collaboration look like today? What's plus one? And what's another plus one on top of that? So you guys take a moment. I'm going to be silent for just a minute. You guys take a moment and maybe think about and even write down answers to these three questions for me. And if anyone would like to, throw a comment into chat. All right. Give me a thumbs up if you've answered that question. Zero feedback, people. Hey, here we go. All right. Cool. Okay. 
okay, I'm going to move on to the next page. We've got about a third of the people saying yep. My next question for you all is what's the cost of collaboration? So we've asked what's the benefit of collaboration. We've asked it at these different locus from like myself, my team, my company, customer and community. We've then asked, let's get specific. Let's benchmark ourselves of what good looks like, but also what's plus one look like and what's plus two look like. So we've got a tentative roadmap of better collaboration forming in our heads. Now I want to ask you, what are the costs of collaboration, right? Once again, I'd like you to answer this at the context of the cost to yourself, the cost to your team, the cost to the company, the cost to the customer, and the cost to the community. So you guys take some time, and then once you've started answering that, I will start playing back some of the entertaining comments that you're going to share share with me. Um, patience is absolutely a cost that we have to bear, right, because we want to go faster. But it's like that adage, go fast, go alone. Delivering a tangible and scalable solution, opening up cross-functional opportunities within the team and the outside team as well. That strikes me as one of the benefits or one of the plus ones from the previous question. Accepting and learning from failures. I imagine that's an individual cost. Cost to an individual, your personal aspiration, you're putting the well-being of the group ahead of your own. Great, great examples, people. Great examples. Let's also think about the cost to the team, the cost to the company. What are the costs of collaboration? One example of both the team and the company level is it takes time to do things well. And so the trade-off to work more intimately and collaboratively with each other is jobs take longer. Another cost to the organisation may be new tools, new infrastructure need to be deployed into the workspace. So, for example, the last six months, as many of us have been working from home, um, you know, getting access to tools like this um, that the conference is hosted on or, or video conferencing tools or better microphones or Miro boards or whatever you're using, right, are expenses that the company needs to invest in to get the payback of the value of the collaboration. Um, there's a great one here from Madhu. Uh, the cost of the company, one of the things that the Agile teams will do is they'll deliver something that's not really perfect to get it out so that they can get feedback. And in the end, that generates a better result because we're sense-making collaboratively with our customers and with our stakeholders, but the company feels like it's suffering reputational damage or it's you know not in control of the situation and so anxiety and fear levels may go up in some parts of the organisation. Another one from uh, Devan is the cost of the team. Like if, if we have to spend time collaborating, we've got to start rapport building and start talking to each other and let other people go first and listen to them versus talk and all those sorts of things. They're, they're all true, right? And even just building a basic competence in collaboration takes time and effort to master. So you've got to put the time, that, the time in that way as well. What about the cost to the customer or to the community? What examples can you guys share with me on that front? What does it cost a customer to be more collaborative? Dedicating time to collaborate with the R&D team, for instance. Absolutely. Absolutely. And they, they need to appreciate the payback, right? And, and you have to consider... What's a person's time horizon? Do they, if they put two hours of their time in, when do they want to get the reward back from that? And is the work you're doing generating that sentiment? One, um, one go-to I have with the customer is we've all got phones and we all hate our phone companies. Um, at the end of every phone call to a phone company, they like to send you a net promoter score survey. 
uh, would you like to advocate on our behalf and get your friends to come and be customers of our company? The answer 100% of the time is no, because you're my phone company. And the ideal relationship I have with you is you take money out of my bank account every month and I never speak to you. But my phone and internet is always there, right? That's the relationship I want with them. I never want to speak about them, but I want them to reliably be there. So when you're working with customers, when we've just had a broadcast message. When you're working with customers, um, when you're working with customers, realize the value proposition that you're offering to them and the expectations that they have of you and balance the work you do in that context. Um, here's some others, time and money, commitment, reprioritization of work items. Uh, as in since initially the value of delivery will be slower, the team might miss on certain commitments. Cost to the community, environmental impact, absolutely. Um, we collectively tend to think of technology, but all projects aren't just technology ones. Um, I want to talk about reprioritizing briefly as well. We, we go and talk to, we have a plan, we meet the customers, we have a plan, we lay it out, and then we go and do things to them like say, well, actually the end users want something different. We're changing your plan. And depending on the person, they can have a spike in anxiety and fear because all of a sudden they're not in control of the situation. And so recognizing um, people's tolerance for uncertainty is another aspect to thinking about the cost for the customer. And lastly, the community one, the environmental one, um, you know, the physical environments one, also the social and uh, societal aspects. Like we're hearing a lot about Twitter and Facebook and their contribution to the death of America's democracy at the moment, right? So uh, what's going on there, I guess? All right, I'm going to move on to the next page. Um, the next thing I'd like you guys to reflect on is the physical environment you work. Uh, it's not the physical environment. It's the system, systemic environment you work in, right? So that includes the physical spaces, the tools, the digital tools, as well as the physical ones. Um, it can include organizational structures or standard processes. It can include all sorts of things. And so what I'd like you guys to do is list the things that you think foster collaboration and list the things that you think discourage collaboration. Now, it's, it's an interesting topic because some things could live on both sides of the ledger depending on how they're done. And an example I'll share with you is manager one-on-ones. So in the left, fosters collaboration, managers meet up with their team members, maybe on a weekly basis, and say, how are things going for you? What's, what are you finding interesting? What are you proud of? What's challenging you? What, what help can I give you? What, what's going on? How are you feeling? Right? And a coaching conversation that kind of probes into those areas will surface opportunities for improvement, but it's proactive improvement where you're problem solving together in a coaching context with an employee a different type of manager one-on-one -on -one could be, here are your KPIs, you're 70% done, but you're behind schedule, what's going on, right? That's an accusatory one, maybe focused on individual contribution at the expense of team performance. There's a whole bunch of things that could be going wrong in that type of manager one-on-one. -on -one. So, so just a thing like a manager one-on-one -on -one meeting could live in both of those boxes, depending on how they're executed. What I'd like you guys to do is just share one or two or even three, if you like, system conditions that foster collaboration and system conditions that discourage collaborations. Write them down, and if anyone would like, throw them into chat and I'll call them out. Meanwhile, I'm going to ask for another thumbs up. If you guys are enjoying the session, could I get the thumbs up? A little bit of feedback for me just to tell me whether I'm on track or not. All right, well, it is playing okay. Nice one. List the system conditions at your workplace that foster collaboration. List the system conditions at your work that discourage collaboration. No cubicles. 
I have another story that I'll play to you while you're all writing your own answers. Back in 2009, I had a software development team at a government organization, and we were moved from the IT floor to a floor full of data entry people that were doing mail and process work. And so our team took our whiteboards, we had all our sticky notes and index cards, and we, we were in little um, desks that were all interlocked, interlocked in triangles. And so we put the whiteboards in a circle around our team area, and it was kind of like the wagons encircling the camp. And anyway, we were there for a couple of weeks, and our team used to laugh a lot, used to enjoy working together, but it was a government organisation, and most people in that particular organisation were pretty miserable most of the time because they had a bad organisational culture. One thing led to another, and the employees on the floor we were with complained about our whiteboards making the workspace less visually appealing. And so the cleaners on the weekend took everything away. And my team turned up on Monday morning and all of the post-it notes and all of the architecture diagrams and all of the like pinups of the UI were all gone, right? Of course, my team wanted to protest and say, we can't work, all our planning artifacts are gone. But it's just an example of uh, the space, right? And, and the, what's expected from the broader organizational community and how buildings are designed and how workspaces are designed can affect the way we work. Right? Um, discourage individual KPIs. I don't know what WE3 environment is, to be honest. Sorry about that, could be. Yeah, all right, cool. I shared a couple of examples, hope you're amused. Next page. Collaboration workbook. So this is one on you, right? If you were going to make a change in the next 30 days to make your workplace more collaborative, I'm just going to pause for a second and go, we asked ourselves what the benefits of collaboration are at those different levels. We asked, where are we today? What does plus one look like? What does plus two look like? We asked ourselves, what are the costs of collaboration? We've also just then asked ourselves, what are the system conditions, the environmental factors that amplify and suppress collaboration? What I'd like you guys to do now is nominate one thing that you can do within the next 30 days to foster better collaboration. Throw that into the chat if you'd like me to call it out. Because of course, the benefit of a reflective session like this First of all, you're thinking about your context, but also anything we play back publicly, i.e. in chat, we can help our neighbours. We can share that with our community and then they can be stimulated by great ideas. An open session with the entire team, informal retrospectives. By informal retrospective, I don't know exactly what you mean, Ankit, but I'm going to say sometimes a team coming together and being guided by facilitated structured conversations hinders the right conversation. And sometimes you can just pull people together and say, what do you people want to talk about, right? And take the structure away. And then that can open up some really insightful and great conversations. Ah, ex excellent, Ankit. I knew what you were talking about. And so Rushit's also asked, ask team members to focus on discussions when in a meeting. So my business partner one time earlier this year said, Craig, you're always looking at your phone when we're on conferences. And I'm like, yeah, I am. <laughs> he says, put your phone out of reach. So I put my phone out of reach. It became a great habit to do that because then I listen more carefully and focus more intently on the people that I'm talking to. One of the things that we encourage but we don't force is for people to put cameras on because eyes on, face to face, does demonstrate, it's not about what you get, it's about what you give. It demonstrates focus and intent and listening more powerfully than just having the camera off, for instance. Um, here's another one. In the team meeting, you don't have everyone agreeing with the subject. Address the reservations of the individual before, during or after the meeting. So I guess there's circumstances in there, but that's right, like don't force consensus. There's this great stuff around decision-making that says consent is a better decision-making form than consensus, for instance. Um, 
Because if you make people say yes in a meeting room, when they walk out of that meeting room, they may not be bought in to what you're doing. And so I think giving voice to people and, and making sure that they're heard. And again, this goes this goes to listening skills, right? Like it's a great and powerful tool for leveling up collaboration. How can you manifest that? How can you specifically and demonstrably do that in the next month? Open channels, workspaces for collaboration. Ensure to circulate meeting minutes, presumably within a timely manner. Yeah, so there's lots of things that we can do to help other people, right? And again, if you look at these things, a lot of these suggestions that are coming out are all about not what's good for you, but what's good for others. And that's the core of collaboration, stepping forward and helping others be successful. I hope you've all written an idea down and I hope you all post it, note it to your monitor and you look at it every day until it's executed on. You can let me know later. Um, if you've been writing into this thing and you'd like me to share details, I'm eventually, um, probably over my summer at the end of this year, going to write up a paper on this and I'll just anonymize all the data and I'll be sharing some stuff, but I'm going to share you some early versions of what that data looks like in just a minute. So, but if you'd like to engage in conversation or anything, just put your contact details there and I will, um, I will talk to you. And there's also a keep my stuff private uh, thing there as well. So, oh, by the way, and I don't sell any of that. I don't do anything with it. It's purely just to share back into the Agile community. Um, and it's just because I think this is a really interesting topic. Now, what I'm going to do is um, just pause for a moment. So if you guys want, um, you can find me via Conf Engine and you can message me via that, or you can contact me via whatever method you, leave, you like or, or this form. So the form... I'll put the whoops. I'll put this link here, which is a way of doing this form in the uh, in the chat at the very end of the session. And of course, I'll be in the um, uh, I don't know the VIP lounge or whatever the lounge or whatever it is at the end of this session, so we can chat more if anyone wants to. Now, what I want to do now in our last ten minutes is I'm going to play back some of the data that I've gathered from people so far. And then I'm going to summarize that with my insights and what I think this all means to me. Now, you're going to hear me say some very basic things, right? And I think that's amusing because it brings me back to this mode of like, we often think there's magic to high performance, but high performance comes from doing fundamental basic things consistently, right? So you'll hear that in a minute. Now, before I go down that path, I'm going to talk about my research methodology briefly. Um, just to give you the context of how this data was, was established. Um, one last thing before I go forward into playing this out, um, I hope you've enjoyed the opportunity to sit here and reflect on what collaboration means to you and to put a couple of different lenses on it. Um, and I hope that you guys um, see some opportunity in thinking and talking like this. And perhaps even you just take these questions and run them as a retrospective in your own team. Uh, I'm going to be explicit. I'm going to say, if you found value in the session so far, give me a thumbs up. Here we go. It's nice. One of the measures of performance is how many people are interacting versus sitting passively while they're doing other work, because we don't know. <laughs> All right. So uh, what I want to do now is uh, the methodology, right? So, all right, here we go. Like all science experiments, this started with a hunch. And my hunch was collaboration was starting to turn into a dirty word in the Agile community, right? It was starting to turn into one of those power words where some manager says, you're not collaborating my way. Um, and so I don't want to hear you. And it's this convergence into best practices and dogmatic you know, idealism that gets in our way of openness and working together and learning together and improving together, right? And I think if people are locking into there's a best way to do things, that's, that's this local optimization that gets us good this week but doesn't get us good for next year, right? And so that was one of the things that I was worrying about. On the back of that, 
I decided to do some research and I found a bunch of interesting stuff. And I've kind of not directly spoken to it, but I've touched on a bunch of interesting stuff around what makes up good collaboration. And so things like putting other people first and putting the, the good of the group ahead of the individual, for instance, comes through in the academic research quite strongly. But there's more. Now, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a lousy conference speaker because I think uh, it's better for me to pose questions than to give answers, right? And so what I want to do is tease you and say there's a wealth of academic information out there about good collaboration that you can dig into if you'd like to. Regardless, the next thing I did is I formed a hypothesis and um, uh, then I implemented a survey. And this, by the way, is a cut down version of the survey. Usually I kind of take about an hour, to, an hour and 15 minutes to do it. Um, and then I gathered the information, right? And so went through this analysis process, which I'll talk about in a minute, generated insights, and we're still tinkering around with it. Um, some of the data that... Um, some of the research stuff that I, I started with at the very beginning, one is there's an organisational psychologist in Australia called Neil Preston, and he, he presented this model, corruption, coercion, competition, compliance, cooperation, collaboration and co-creation. So he's, he's linked these kind of different perspectives of working together up to co-creation. And so the idea I got out of that is we can actually unpack this word collaboration and we can actually anchor it to different stages in this hierarchy or this, this um, maturity perspective, right? That was one thing I thought of. And so there you go. The next one on the right-hand side is like this broad versus local perspective, right? And so, you know, we've got Deming there as well. And so there's this idea of like what's our system and what's the context we operate in. So systems thinkers are always challenging themselves with what are the boundaries on this system that we're talking about? And so by asking about what does collaboration cost and contribute to our community, it changes our perspective than when we're just thinking about like ourselves or our team and four or five people that we work with day to day. Um, and I think by taking that broader perspective, it changes the way we think about some of these topics, right? And we get less focused on some of those details and start to think more holistically and big picture. Of course, there's the Deming stuff, systems drive outcomes. Most of us are familiar with that. Um, and then lastly, there's some ideas out of product management. Whenever you're kind of looking at a problem and you want to get a breakthrough innovation, one of the ideas you should experiment with is bundling and unbundling. Um, another idea is lean change. So improvements, Jason Little wrote that book years ago called Lean Change. And the idea being when change is deployed in an organization, the people at the front line are probably best equipped to know what to improve and how to improve it. And you get like the and on cord in the Toyota way and you get like, you know, um, the lead from the front and all that sort of stuff. And then the last one is language of a tool of a, is a tool of oppression. And that comes out of some 1960s and early 1970s research about psychology and sociology and stuff like that. So that was some of my areas that I was aware of at the very beginning that helped me form the views. Um, the next thing, the hypothesis. So the hypotheses that I went in with is I think Collaboration's headed the way of a power word. I think also that people have a very fuzzy and loose idea of what collaboration is. And I think that loose, intangible, fuzzy view gets in the way of us making concrete improvement plans. And then we fall into the world of best practices and following other people's patterns versus mindfully improving in our own contexts. Um, I also think that um, the fact of reflecting on a topic makes us more aware and helps us form more concrete views of what a thing is. And so taking a question-oriented approach to this session um, kind of locks me in it, like comes from that, comes from that hypothesis. And the last one is like I actually went in with this hypothesis that I think um, in the Agile community in particular, we say a lot of things are best practice or what we should do, but our behaviours are different. And so one of the things I was thinking of here is um, we would believe, uh, you know, collaboration and mindful improvement and all those things are good, but then when we look at what Agile coaches are doing, they're just kind of teaching us to paint by the numbers using Scrum or Kanban or whatever. Uh, it turned out, um, have I answered those things in this? It turned out, I'll give you the answers in a minute. So then I did the survey. Um, when I got the answers, I go through this bucketing process and I create some charts. Uh, this is the survey. Um, there's the buckets. I will tell you the hypotheses, right? Do we think, oh, actually, I'll show you the charts first. 
So the, the storytelling one, tell me a story of when you did great collaboration at all these meetups and conferences. I've kind of stacked it up. That's the distribution of people, and there's some examples there to help you benchmark against your own real world. I'll put this on Conf Engine immediately after the session, by the way. Um, so that's the kind of the spread across Dr. Preston's hierarchy, competition, compliance, cooperation, etc. The next thing is what's good look like or what's collaboration look like, what is better, plus one, plus two. And you see these topics, alignment, flow, learning, respect, nurture, purpose, autonomy, shared problems, transparency. They're the things. This, this, is, the th this is the areas that people are intending to go, right, to improve things. Um, or, or what, what good looks like today is orange, what better looks like is the next two colours. Then I ask the question around the costs, right? So in this one, the costs, sorry, I'm just working the PowerPoint thing a little bit. Uh, in this instance, the cost to me, most people express that as time. Um, the cost to my team, once again, expressed as time. The cost of the organisation starts to be shaped as money, but money and time, more or less the same thing. The cost to customers presented as low quality. Where did I put community? Hmm, I haven't got it there. But what's come out just in the last few months doing it during the COVID season is also uh, also emerging is trust um, over in the organisation and customer size is trust and faith. Um, and over on the cost of me and my team, another thing that's emerging more recently is energy um, particularly emotional energy, right? I'm going in to challenge the status quo. I'm going in to try to make things better. You know, I'm trying to drive for better collaboration. I'm trying to get us all on the same page. But there's all these current state factors that play against me, right? People's current behaviours, how they're incented, the way management treats us, all these things. Sure, they take time, but they also take resilience and emotional energy to persist. Right? So that's another thing that's emerging more recently. Lastly, system conditions. So that's just the same kind of stuff. Shared purpose, respect, co-location. <laughs> that's one from pre-COVID days. But appreciation, autonomy, aligned approach, making progress, nurturing feedback and structure. So all those things help us, uh, help us perform if those things are in place. Now, what I got out of that from the hypotheses is, do we think collaboration's headed the way of a cliche or a power word? Well, maybe. Right? It doesn't really come through the data, but at the end of each of these sessions, I have a conversation with people and people tend to express uh, that that's true. So I anecdotally am hearing it, but I'm not seeing it come through in the data. The second one is we think people have a fuzzy idea of what co collaboration looks like. That leads to suboptimal results. We think getting more concrete will help us build better roadmaps. And that's a very concrete yes to that one. So the feedback of doing this generates concrete plans for people to make their working life better. The next one is by doing this, you form, well, that's kind of part two of the same one. And the last one is like, we think people will say one thing and do another and that will come through. And the idea is maybe, right? So I think that's people, we saw some variation in thoughts and actions, but it doesn't really come through strongly. And I think what the deal is, is that means that there's, some signals, but we need to kind of poke into it more further, probably with some interviews or something like that to, to reframe that particular thing. So we're not 100% sure. So what's come out of this is like I, I have a very firm view that doing this workshop and really asking yourself what is collaboration and unpacking the idea and coming at it from a costs and benefits point of view and, you know, and, and looking at it from different perspectives helps you think about what you need to do to make your workplace more collaborative um, and, and also get the payoff at the right rate. Um, here's my three big insights in my last one minute. So we all have a shared view that collaboration is good in the abstract, but we need a more concrete plan. The priority areas that we think have the most impact for good from those two charts, a shared mission, alignment in priorities, flow, and a culture of respect and learning. So if you're an agile coach or, or a manager, right, those five things are the things that you want to focus on putting in place if you want better collaboration, right? Shared mission, alignment in priorities, flow, and a culture of respect and learning. And lastly, if we want to break beyond our current levels of performance via collaboration, 
we need you and me, the person to my left and the person to my right. We all need to muster the mental and emotional energy to deal with that, right? So that would go to the idea of forming alliances, talking to other people, um, not going out the front alone but going together with others, right, so that we don't burn out, right? So they're, they're the kind of the big takeaways for me. And so I think with that, I will kill the uh, – and I'll say – that's my little collaboration story. I hope it was useful for you.